Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Craig Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. Well, welcome to Beyond the Art. Today we have Deborah Yepin Papan. Uh, she's a visual artist, a digital collage, and co-founder for the Center for Native Futures. You're also from the Hemis Pueblo tribe, correct? Hemis Pueblo, yes. Hemis Pueblo. Well, welcome to the show, Deborah. We really appreciate you being on today. So, why don't you go ahead and just uh, tell us a little bit about your story? Oh my gosh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I was born. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> that's a good place to start. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I just I, I do want to say thank you. Thank you so much for this invitation um, to uh, come here and speak with you and share um, about who I am and about my work. Um, so I am Deborah Yepo Papan. Um, I was born in Korea. Uh, and immigrated to the United States with my mother when I was about five months old. And we lived in Jemez Pueblo um, with my father's family for um, for a short time before we moved up here to Chicago, um, where I've been for uh, most of my life since I was right, about right. Um, almost two years old. And um, so Chicago has been my home um, very much, you know, um, an influence on, uh, you know, who I am today, you know, growing up in the city in an urban area, um, growing up as a mixed race person, um, you know, because I'm both Korean and Jemez Pueblo. Um, but thankfully, you know, uh, I, I'm so grateful to my parents for making sure that I am very connected to my home in Hamas. Um, so, you know, they always made sure that we would go back home to visit with family and to stay connected. Um, and I carry on that tradition with my daughter who is uh, born and raised Chicago. Um, I went back to school in Santa Fe, or I went back to Santa Fe um, to go to school at uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts. So Fantastic. that's kind of where my um uh my journey into becoming an artist uh pretty much started at at that point and um i, I do had you, a do you, I, do you view yourself as a native american artist is that what you identify um, as i you know i go back and forth on that i um i'm an artist um, I'm Native American. Um, so yes, you know, and I, I am a Native artist. Um, but sometimes I feel like that term can also kind of pigeonhole somebody. Correct. Right. Um, you know, because there are certain expectations on what Native people should be making as, right. as far as art um, is concerned. Um, so, you know, the work I do, the work I make is very personal to me. Um, it's very much about, you know, who I am, my identity, um, those things that, uh, you know, I'm very proud of, um, you know, those parts of my culture that, um, you know, I, I identify with or relate to through my art. I mean, that my art is how I connect to my culture and how I stay close to my culture. Um, so I think art sometimes comes from that very personal place. So, you know, if you happen to be a native person um, and you're making art related to your identity in that way, then um, it's, you know, it, it's going to um, have a certain aesthetic. Um, so, you know, yeah, my, my art is just, it's, it's what it is. It's, it's my art. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of your DNA. It's part of your essence as a, as an artist. Um, I think it comes from within, obviously. And it, is attached to, I think, your heritage, your cultural elements, and also your surrounding and upbringing. What do you think defines your work? Um, what defines my work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not 
sure what defines my work. Um, again, you know, I just, I, I draw from my personal experiences, um, of being a mixed race person, of being a proud mother, of being a Pueblo person. Um, and, you know, so a lot of my work is about, um, just, you know, embodying that, showcasing that mm-hmm. who I am as a contemporary Pueblo person who lives in an urban area. Right. Um, but how much my cultures um, are so much a part of who I am and how I raise my daughter as well. And how, you know, the person that, um, you know, I, I'm raising her to be as well. But, well, she's an adult now. <laughs> but, um, you know, she is very influenced by the cultures that make up who she is as well. And so I think, you know, a lot of other mixed race Native people, um, you know, they relate to my work because I talk about that. You know, I'm very open about, um, you know, being part of two different diverse cultures. Um, but, you know, I embrace that. I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't let anyone define who I am. Um, and so, you know, I hope that that's a message that comes across and comes across in my artwork as well. How are you inspired? Are you inspired culturally from, um, your heritage or are you inspired by your heritage incorporated into today's environment? Um, I think I'm more or less incorporate or um, influenced by just just my heritages, and um, it's how my environment kind of I don't want to say influences it, but how my environment just is a part of all of that. Um, because you, I mean, whatever environment you're in, you can't. You can't disconnect from that. Correct. Um, it interacts, and it interacts just in the same way that I can't. State. Right. Right. Just like I can't disconnect from my cultures, from, you know, what, right. what, um, you know, make up who I am. So they just kind of all come together. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to, to describe because just for me, it's just, it's natural. It's normal. What inspires you? What inspires me just, um, you know, finding those ways to connect with, you know, with, with my culture. I mean, I'm inspired by, you know, community, just being around other native people about, you know, being around other native artists, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and watching it being around like other creativity and other creative people, um, especially is very inspiring. Um, the fact that now I have this opportunity to create a space for other native people, um, you know, through my center for native futures, um, you know, founded along with other, uh, close friends, um, and my husband, who is also an artist, Chris Bopan, um, Monica Rickard Bolter, Andrea Carlson, um, you know, we came together to, fulfill this dream of creating this space for other native people, other native artists. And, um, you know, just the act of wanting to do that is inspiring. And then now that we have the space is very inspiring. I can just imagine, you know, the collective force coming together actually I think is inspirational for another artist because it does inspire you to be around that surroundings and the, as you could say, creative juices flowing, you know, uh, would motivate me, uh, being in that type of environment. So what's your process when you start creating, um, some of your pieces, do you draw, do you just go to work? (laughs) Um, I don't draw, I don't paint. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of weird, my process too. Like I, I'm not, um, I'm not somebody who creates every day. I'm not a full-time artist. Um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes I wish I had that luxury of being a, a full-time artist, but at the same time, um, you know, my ideas come to me in spurts. So I create bodies of work in spurts. Um, 
you know, so the last time I was able to create a, a body of work was, well, just recently I had a solo exhibition um, back in January. So um, that was a, a huge motivator to create something new. Right. But the last time, you know, before then was back in 2017. So um, it's really kind of like wherever my my brain space is and what capacity I have at the time, because you know, I, I work a full-time job. Um, you know, I have to make a living. I don't right. make a living off of my art. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of my creativity in the past five years has been in my day job, my work here at the Field Museum, um, where I'm the Native Community Engagement Coordinator. And um, I was very closely involved in helping to redevelop um, the Native American exhibition, which is now Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories. So that is where a lot of my energy, my mental capacity has gone into. So I haven't really had the opportunity to just stop and create. However, I'm constantly mm -hmm. thinking like my head is always like, you know, like, oh, I wish I could do this. <laughs> I wish I could do that. But I think I've just been building up that bank for the past five years. And um, so then I was able to create a, a new um, small series of work um, that I, I'm pretty proud of. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, what you're doing in being the co-founder for the Center for Native Futures, tell us a little bit more about that, because it sounds so invigorating and something that's much needed uh, for a collective space for Native American artists to come together and actually showcase their work. Um, I don't think there's many venues like that around the country where obviously there should be. Um, but tell us a little bit about that. And what inspired you to actually start that? Yeah, um, that's actually been a very long time dream. Um, you know, I met my husband, Chris, when we both went to IAIA in Santa Fe, and he came to Chicago with me. And, um, you know, we were ready to build our careers as artists. And you would think that a big city like Chicago would have you know, opportunities for Native art and Native artists to be shown, but there weren't. And that was very um, disappointing, though not surprising. There weren't very, there weren't any galleries that were representing Native artists. Um, nobody was showing Native art. And so, you know, our, our opportunities were very, very few um, outside of, you know, like one a nonprofit organization that was showcasing um, our native art, but it was like maybe one show every couple years. Um, we had to go outside of the city of Chicago to build our art career. That was also a time when, um, you know, art galleries were kind of intimidating spaces to approach. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like how do you, as a new up and coming artist, walk into a gallery and show your portfolio and say, Hey, show my art. Um, you know, it's such an intimidating process. Right. Um, so we avoided it altogether. And, you know, so at the time that was our dream, our dream was, you know, like, what if we won a million dollars in the lottery? What would we do with that money? Um, you know, I would love to buy a building where we could have our own gallery space, where we could have studio space for artists to work in, where we can form our own community and work within proximity to each other, um, you know, influence, inspire, motivate each other and show our work. Um, and that was back in the 90s where we had this dream. and. Um, you know, we continue to dream this and it wasn't until recently and during the pandemic as our, you know, native arts community started to somewhat grow here in Chicago, mm -hmm. um, but still not having opportunities to show anywhere in the city. You know, the, the Art Institute, the MCA, you know, these art organizations and these other galleries were still not showing native artists or if they were showing Native artists, they weren't tapping into the local Native community here. They were always going outside, bringing other artists in. And then at the same time, too, not reaching out to Native community to become 
engaged or involved mm-hmm. either. So that was another disappointment. And so, um, you know, during the pandemic, um, our small group would get together to, just to support each other. And we'd meet on, you know, Zoom. And one day it was, you know, we just said, hey, why don't why don't we just do this? Let's just do it. Yeah. Um, and so a friend of ours, um, you know, she had the know-how and how to start, you know, 501c3 organizations. And um, she helped us get started and we got our 501c3 status um, in less than, seemed like less than four months or so. Um, oh, and yeah, so we, um, and we got financial support right off the bat. Uh, you know, we got some seed funding and, um, you know, that seed funding is what pushed us to, you know, like, okay, this is real. We got it. We got to do this now. Um, and, and here we are. So what's your ultimate goal for uh, the center? Um, it's always been to have that space that's, um, you know, for native artists to support native arts here in Chicago, um, to kind of be like an epicenter for native art in the Midwest. Um, so we definitely want to, you know, this home or this place to be a home for Chicago based artists or, you know, artists that are within this area. Um, and then also acknowledging those artists, um, that are from tribes that were displaced from this area as well. Um, but then also branching out and really creating this hub for native artists to come to when they come to Chicago. We want to be a destination for native people when they come to Chicago. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's exciting and it's, it's really big that we are the only native led um, native art center here in Chicago, but we don't want to be the only ones. Um, you know, we're happy to be helping to open the doors right now, but it would be amazing to see other, you know, native art centers, native art galleries popping up all over the city, um, and just all over the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's what we're hoping to, oh, um, start building a, a know, stronger community. I mean, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So- I mean, building that community, I mean, you got to start on the ground level, but you get that foundation started and starts populating. Uh, is it going to be like a maker studio and exhibit space or? Um, so right now we will be moving into um, our physical space by sometime next month. And we do have right now the space that we're in is a storefront space. So definitely there's, um, you know, gallery exhibition area, but we also made sure to build a small studio space um, in the back of our of our storefront. So there will be a studio space mm-hmm. that we would love to um, think about hosting uh, like artist residencies um, or, yes, you know, absolutely having artists working in that space. Fantastic. So will you be doing classes or educational components tied into for youth to learn more about Native American art and get involved? Um, well, I think that we will probably host workshops, um, but we really want to work with artists and, and have, um, you know, artists kind of decide what it is that they want to do. Um, and, you know, I, I we want to definitely put our Native community first and make sure that we have programs that are accessible to Native youth first. Um, I think as Native people, we're always educating people regardless of what we do or where we're at. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know... <laughs> Education is not going to be like our our big priority. Our priority really is to give exposure to Native art and artists. Um, And I think the education kind of follows, but that's not going to be like the bigger Mm -hmm. focus. Um, I mean, I think if you just think of us as, um, you know, like, yeah, an art gallery first um, where we have artists making and, and, you know, um, whatever it is the artist wants to do. So programming will be dependent on, um, you know, the exhibitions that we're hosting and working closely with those artists and what they want to provide. Fantastic. 
Yeah, you, that, you need uh, multiple locations throughout the country. <laughs> There's a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a dream, but again, I think, it, you know, <laughs> let it grow. Yeah. <laughs> let it grow. Yeah. Let it flourish. Were there any challenges um, when you started to have this idea and then kind of building the blocks for it? There were any challenges or risk factors or people saying, you know, the naysayers that are out there saying, no, nah, don't do it. It's not needed. Uh, no, no, not at all. I mean, I think the only, um, because again, you know, this was a dream that we, we had back in the nineties. So the only thing that kind of held that back was just, um, at the time, not having enough support, um, not having, not having the time or the money. Um, so really, you know, um, money is a huge, huge, um, you know, barrier if you don't have uh, those types of resources that makes it a little more difficult to get started. Um, And also just, you know, wanting to start a 501c3, like there's so much you need to know about running a nonprofit organization that um, we weren't well equipped for at the beginning. Um, And You know, again, it was having to have conversations and bringing in other partners, other people that had the same dream or the same interests, um, and then maybe having different skills too, um, and then bringing us all together. So that took a lot of time to to help that grow. And so, um, and that happened, you know, just within the past five years in, you know, like folks like Andrea Carlson moving to Chicago and then becoming a part of our small um, group, our small, you know, collective, and then, mm-hmm. um, and then bringing up these conversations with them and then finding that support and then, um, finding the people with the money, um, right. that were so supportive. But if anything, I mean, I think it, it feels like it's such a good time to be doing this because there is so much support because there are so many people now that are recognizing what a necessity this is, especially for the city of Chicago. Um, And so we haven't gotten any pushback um, in that regard. I mean, people have been very, very supportive. Have some of the bigger institutions supported you or come up to you and saying, we support you. We want to partner or help you in any way that we can. Um, Not so much the institutions, (laughs) <laughs> but um, foundations and funders, um, a lot of um, maybe smaller, smaller spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, you know, uh, we've actually like in the last, maybe last year have gotten a lot of people that have wanted to partner with us in some way, um, which is wonderful. It's great. And, um, you know, we're, we're happy that people want to partner with us. Um, but I feel like we're just so inundated now with so many people coming at us from all directions that, um, you know, well, we kind of need to like, you know, kind of hold back a little bit because we, we've got some work (laughs) that we need to focus on first. Um, but we have been partnering with some people like, uh, you know, Columbia college here in Chicago, um, Illinois humanities, um, we have a few upcoming partnerships. Um, so I think on a smaller scale, not necessarily those bigger institutions just yet. Well, that's good that people are knocking on your door, though, you know, instead of it being so quiet, you know, it helps promote you and your endeavor and get the word out. So besides yourself and your husband, who else is in your clan that's helped build the center with you? Yeah. Um, you know, Monica Rickard Bolter, she's, um, black and prairie band Potawatomi and she is Chicago based. Um, she's a very, very good friend of ours, very um, close friend. Um, she is right now our first staff member as well. So she is our director of operations. She's been doing a lot of that, um, you know, the administrative work and all the, uh, a lot of uh, the leg work for us. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrea Carlson as well. Um, you know, she's, uh, now she's a Chicago based artist, though she's away at a residency right now. But, um, you know, again, another huge supporter. Um, 
uh, Patrick Del Percio, who is a Cherokee language instructor, um, also one of the founders of a program called TIES, which is um, a program that supports uh, LGBTQ, um, native LGBTQ um, uh, poets. And so, you know, they're very uh, kind of language based and poetry based. So that's a program that we've kind of um you know, took under our wings under Center for Native Futures. And um, and River Kerstetter, who is um, also a part of TIES as well. So, and, and we had help from Heather Miller, who um, was here in Chicago at the time. And she, uh, she was the one with the organizational know-how and was able to get us our 501c3. Um, but I mean, she's she's moved on and she's doing wonderful things at the Illinois State Museum right now. Um, but largely it's, um, you know, Monica, Chris uh, and, and I forgot to mention my husband, Chris, or you mentioned him. Um, but uh, Monica, Chris, <laughs> um, Andrea and I are. Yeah, we're, we're carrying a heavy load right now and trying to, um, you know, push the, the uh, center forward. Lots on your shoulders, but very inspirational and important, important cause and imp- important it's endeavor. Good work. Um, yeah, it's important work. It, it, it's work that, you know, should be done. Mm-hmm. And I, I applaud you for all of you for doing this and taking the time. Uh, I know it's probably a very long and tedious process. Mm-hmm. Um, so have you already started doing exhibits in the, the storefront space that you have now? Just get to get the word out. Not yet, because yeah, we haven't we haven't been able to move in yet because our space has been under construction, mm-hmm. um, and so it it won't be ready for us until um, next month. But um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with, but um, there's a, a a huge art um, exposition that happens here in Chicago every year, and it's called Expo Chicago. And um, we've been very fortunate enough to um, have support and funding from the Terra Foundation to um, have a booth at Expo Chicago this year and last year. Um, Expo Chicago this year was just last weekend. And um, there, you know, we made top five on somebody's top five um, booths of Expo, um, which that was exciting. And uh, so those have really been our only um, exhibition opportunities, but um, so well received. Um, you know, we've gotten so many just really good words from people, um, you know, uh, lots of attention from Expo and other, uh, you know, institutions and galleries that, you know, they hear our name and they're like, oh, we've been hearing a lot about you. So that's been exciting um, and very nice. So, um, you know, I, I think that's helped to give us a lot of exposure. And I think, you know, people are excited and looking forward to when we do open to the public in our space. That's, that's, again, I applaud. I, I applaud all of you. So, is your uh, husband uh, a native citizen? He is. He's um, Kanza. He's enrolled with the Kanza Nation um, or Ka Nation, and he's also Osage and Cheyenne River Lakota. Okay, and, and he's an artist as well, correct? Yep, he's a he's a ledger contemporary ledger artist. Okay, fantastic. So let's go back a little to the Hamus uh, Pueblo that you are. So growing up and identifying in two distinct cultures, um, was there something in your childhood that connected you to both? Thinking, oh, there's a similarity because they're so distinct, but yet there's probably some aspects that are traceable that can link into into each other. So as you were going to school, was it something that you thought about in becoming the artist and going to art school to incorporate it into your life and the direction you, you went and the path you uh, set yourself to? Um, yeah. I mean, there, I, I was always, always aware at how different and diverse, um, 
you know, both cultures are. But at the same time, there are just, you know, there's so many similarities just um, in, you know, cultural values um, in, uh, you know, just Mm -hmm. um, the way that my mother, you know, my my mother brought me up on, uh, you know, in in, with Korean values. Um, But, you know, there there culturally, too, there are a lot of similarities just, you know, in spirituality and um, in, in other ways. But. Um, I mean, it wasn't something that I really thought about as I was growing up. I mean, it was just normal for me, you know, it was just natural for me to, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, because that, that's just how that was there. Exactly. So, um, you know, it, it's not something that, uh, I, I, I looked at a certain way or, um, you know, analyzed in a certain way. It's just that, I mean, that was just my, that's my life. That was just part of your DNA and who you are. Um, Mm -hmm. How would you describe yourself as an artist since you do visual art and digital collage? How would you describe yourself as an artist, given that you don't have much time, given everything that you have on your plate at the moment? Um, I mean, exactly that. I, you know, I I don't hesitate to tell people that I'm a visual artist um, and you know, I'm honest about, uh, you know, what my capabilities are or what my capacity is at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think for a lot of artists, um, you know, some artists can, um, and do, you know, uh, make their art full time. Um, they have that ability and I, I think, you know, there, there isn't one way to be an artist, Um, and, and my way right now is, you know, I put my family first. Um, I put, you know, I've always put my daughter first and, um, you know, the work that I'm doing here at the field museum kind of came first in a way too, partly because one, you know, I have to make a living and I had to put my daughter, I'm still putting my daughter through college, but, um, you know, and the work here is so important for native people. Um, you know, to, to change and challenge colonial institutions, um, you know, like the Field Museum, um, and, and to make sure that Native people are represented um, in the best way possible. I mean, that's such important work that, um, you know, I, it, it was easy for me to make that choice and prioritize that and, and kind of set my art aside. But, um, you know, I'm always making art like in my head. It, it just, it's just work that hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, and, and it will someday when, when I, you know, when I have that opportunity to let those floodgates open. But, um, you know, I think, uh, that I'm still an artist, even though I'm not physically creating or making art right now, I am doing a lot of other things that are creative and that are working toward being able to make another body of work again. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, given your, your, what you're doing now at the field museum and what they represent, you know, for native Americans to tell their story, not be reinterpreted or translated by a third party. Um, So tell us a little bit more about what you do at the field museum. Yeah, so I've been here as the Native Community Engagement Coordinator, and um, I started out as a volunteer back in 2017. Um, and this was after uh, my husband's um, art exhibit. He had an exhibition here at the Field Museum that opened in 2016, and his exhibition became an intervention in the old Native American Hall. The old Native American Hall had display cases that were originally, um, uh, they were originally displayed since the fifties. And so, um, and had gone unchanged since. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was very (laughs) highly problematic, um, you know, contributed to a lot of those stereotypes about native people, um, reinforced a lot of the stereotypes that you just see around the city of Chicago. And, um, 
So because his exhibition opened, we were bringing people in to see his exhibition. And I thought, you know, our our curator here, um, you know, she needed help too. She wanted to bring more Native people into the museum. And I told her I could help her with that. So I volunteered and, um, you know, I saw that as a way to open the doors to Native community, to give Native people access to this museum. Um, to see our material culture, to connect with collections. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of the visits that I host, um, you know, I'm also helping to connect, uh, you know, our Native visitors to collections, which is something that's so important. Um, And so then that led to, uh, uh, you know, my role as the community engagement coordinator for the renovation of the Native Hall. So a lot of my work had been, um, you know, helping to reach out to a lot of our Native collaborators, um, offering support for them. Um, But, you know, museum-wide also just kind of challenging, um, you know, uh, perspectives around the museum too, and making sure that there were accurate representations all across the museum on, you know, about Native people. so it's in a nutshell, that's just kind of a handful of, you know, some of the things that uh, I've been doing while I've been here. And how long have you been there? Um, since 2017. So six okay. years. Six years. So have you seen, has it hit the goal or aspire to what you thought you were going to do when you, when you went there? Um. To a degree, um, you know, I, I, I was just hosting a, a group today, um, you know, a visit in uh, the, the Art Native Truths exhibition. And, um, you know, I was mentioning just how proud I am of that work. I'm proud of um, what we did to create, you know, Native Truths. Um, but, you know, I think as an institution, it, it's still a colonial institution and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, you know, and, and yes, I think I, I had bigger expectations that things would, um, you know, go in that direction. Um, right. But I, I feel like these types of institutions will always take, you know, a step forward and two steps back. So, um, you know, I feel like that's kind of where we're at right now. We're kind of in this kind of two steps back moment. (laughs) We got to keep on moving forward. Push it, push it, push it. So the Art Native Truths exhibit that's currently showing at the Field Museum. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, Well, Native Truths is not, um, you know, this is a natural history museum. This is not an Mm -hmm. art museum. Um, However, we do have a lot of art. We do have a lot of contemporary art, contemporary pieces, um, because, you know, art is just such a huge part of our culture. It's a huge part of who we are as Native people. Um, You know, we could be lawyers or doctors and other things and artists too. So, um, you know, it, it, it's unavoidable that, you know, we would have, um, native art all throughout, but really native truths is just, you know, it's about stories. It's about, um, you know, uh, the, the collaborators that we worked with, it's about these folks sharing their lived experience as native people. So, you know, in the past, you would go, maybe in some cases still, you would go to a natural history museum or an anthropology museum, and, um, you know, you would learn about an entire culture from the anthropologist's or archaeologist's perspective, from their lens. And instead, here, um, you're learning directly from our collaborators from native people, you're learning what they want to share with you. Um, you're, you know, you come here and you're kind of immersed in, um, these different communities as you walk through and read the stories, you're being welcomed into somebody's, um, kitchen or into somebody's studio. And, um, you're learning from them what they want to share with you. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the stories touch on these common themes of, 
um, how we're still connected to our ancestors, how they're so very much a part of who we are today. Um, our past is so much a part of our present. Um, but then how we're all also working toward, you know, a, a future. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting you brought that up because I had a conversation with somebody earlier about our ancestors are always with, with us. They're already, they're, they're with us daily. Um, they're part of our daily mm -hmm. life. Um, where a lot of cultures, they're not. But in, in indigenous uh, cultures, it, it is. Part of our ancestry is, is with us. It's part of our DNA, and we carry that with us all the time. So this is more uh, pa participatory than it is curated. Um, it's co-curated. Um, and it is, yes, highly, okay. highly participatory. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but, you know, because our, our collaborators kind of, you know, they, they all fill the role of curator also because they are the curators of those particular stories. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we also have temporary story galleries where our collaborators are also the co-curators for those, uh, those stories as well. So, um, you know, the collaborators fill such a huge role all throughout. I mean, not everybody, um, but most of our collaborators, um, you know, are also the, the co-curators. So since this started, have you seen more people be called to this, called to, called to this <laughs> and want to participate? And tell their story um, or be involved? I, there, you know, there, um, and, and there is a process too, and you know how that is. I, this is a permanent exhibition with um, five rotating story galleries that will rotate out maybe every two years or so. Um, and, 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 you know, all of this is also and has been guided by an advisory committee. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it starts with, you know, having conversations and um, thinking about what those stories can be, what it is that we can share. It's also, um, you know, how these how items and collections can relate to these stories as well. Um, but, yeah, definitely, I think, you know. Native people have been drawn to the Field Museum to see Native truths. And, um, you know, as I get to meet with people, um, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, you know, like, oh, you should talk about this. You should talk about that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, and I have to say, it's, it's, you know, it's not my decision. You know, you're right. I, I think we should, too. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm only one one person on the entire team of people that, you know, on, on the inside here at the museum that mm -hmm. are also working on this. Um, so it's. You know, there there has to be there does have to be structure too, in, in how um, you know stories get shared and what gets shared. Um, and again, that's all uh, you know, also guided by the advisory committee too, which are all um, native advisors. Correct, correct. Um, and just to go back to uh, the center, I know I'm maybe flip flopping here a lot. So, I mean, if there's anything else you want to add, uh, please jump in. So let's go back to uh, the Center for Native Futures. Given your work at Field Museum, is there elements that you want to kind of incorporate into the center to, ver to further expand no. upon? No? No. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. I, I, I think um, working, <laughs> the, uh, you know, one of the other reasons for creating our own center, too, is to do it in our way to, um, you know, from the start, um, you know, incorporate and, and, uh, you know, tap into indigenous ways of doing things and indigenous values. Um, I, you know, and, and to do it in a way that we're not able to in these types of institutions that when they were created, were not created for us in the first place. And so if anything, I think um, there are things that I don't want to do. <laughs> there are things I wouldn't want to replicate. Um, and, you know, that's 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 just how it is. <laughs> you know, I, it's 
we want to do things our way um, and, and not the way that, you know, these institutions right. have been doing things. Right. You want to set your own path to success, not be dictated on what path you're going to take. Um, right. So given that, what is the ultimate, I guess, mission and goal for the center? As you look upon you know, um, your opening and planning out the next five years <laughs> and more work. Yeah, which actually we're in the process right now of our uh, strategic planning. So, uh, you know, we do have to be in that mindset of like, well, what happens in the next five years um, and the next 10 years? Um, right now, our physical space that we're moving into, um, we do know that we our lease will be for um, three years. And we're going to have to think about where we want to go after the three years. And, you know, our ultimate dream um, is to have, you know, our own building where, you know, we can provide that gallery space, but also have studios for, you know, all the Chicago based native artists to, you know, have their own studio in. Um, and so, you know, we, we just, we want this to be an art center. You know, we want to just be able to, um, be a space that native artists can come to and create and be with other native artists. Um, and then we share that out with, you know, with the public, uh, you know, we share our work with the public, but really it's, you know, it's a space for us. Um, I don't think, you know, as native artists, mm -hmm. we don't all often have that opportunity to just have a space for us. Um, so our ultimate goal Very is true. to just, you know, have our own building. That's fantastic. You got to dream big. So is there a long list mm -hmm. of artists that want to be involved? Um, I wouldn't, I mean, people, I, I think everyone who we talk to and everyone <laughs> that we've, um, you know, just been in conversation with has been just, you know, like, yeah, you know, just let us know. Um, you know, we want to support you. Just let us know what we can do. Um, we don't know what that is yet because we just haven't been able to move into our space yet. So, um, right. you know, it's, it's good to know that we have a whole community of people that want to help out in, in various ways, but, um, you know, really it's, it's, a, it's a matter of us just having to get there first, um, and, and seeing how all, all of that is going to work and how that's going to fit. Absolutely. Let you get your doors open first. <laughs> So whatever we can do to help promote you and get the word out, we're here for you because what you're doing is a very important factor and much needed component in the Native American art sector. Uh, so I congratulate you. Congratulate you, Gly. I congratulate you guys. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, doing this because I think every urban community should have something like this in their in their wheelhouse. Is there any uh, oh, thank you. last closing words of wisdom? Oh my gosh, that's like that's the hardest question, <laughs> and I, I'm not good at closing out either. Um, you know, I yeah, I. Well, I, is there I anything you want to add any... or share with us? <laughs> um, just that you know, I'm really excited um, for the future. I am excited about, you know, our possibilities and, and what we're, um, you know, what we can do with Center for Native Futures. Um, you know, I'm so appreciative of all the support for your support. Thank you so much for offering. Um, you know, it's just it, it, it makes this work that much easier when we know that, you know, there are people behind us and that believe in us. Um, and I think just a word for everyone, uh, you know, the reason we call ourselves Center for Native Futures is because um, it's important for us to see ourselves in the future, right? As Native people, uh, you know, our ancestors were, um, you know, futurists. They were always thinking of the future. And so that's what mm. we're trying to do here. Um, and and it, it's beyond just imagining what our future can be, but it's realizing what our future can be and what our future will be. Um, so, yeah, that's I think that's all I have to say. That's a, that's a good closing. 
Well, Deborah, I appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And again, anything we can do and to help support you and get the word out, we're here for you. And again, a, a huge applause to you and your crew and your husband and everyone else involved. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.